Hey there folks, Tim Slate here from the eLearning Designers Academy and community. Thank you so much for tuning in to this how-to workshop where we're going to be taking a look at how to design branching scenarios for eLearning. Now, if you've never watched one of my how-to workshops before, these are meant to be practical, in-depth sessions where we take a look at all things from instructional design to e-learning design to articulate storyline, portfolios, freelancing, and everything else in between. Now, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, make sure to click that like, subscribe, and that bell button so that you'll get alerted the next time I publish a video just like this one. And of course, make sure to join us inside the e-learning designers academy and community with the link down in the comments. It's a great place. It's free. And it's a place where you can connect, network, and learn from others who are also looking to grow their e-learning design design, skills, and careers. All right, so let's jump in and learn a little bit about how to design branching scenarios for e-learning. And I want to start this session by telling you a little bit of a story about the very, 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 very first e-learning course I ever built. You know, for those of you um, who uh, aren't familiar with this, I'll, I'll put a link to my story about how I fell into e-learning and instructional design. But before I became an e-learning designer, before I became an instructional designer, I used to catch shoplifters for a living. I have a degree in criminal justice. And eventually I fell into a role where I was teaching others how to catch shoplifters. And one of my very, very, very first e-learning and instructional design projects was to create a five-part e-learning course series on the five steps for how to catch a shoplifter. And being new to e-learning and being new to instructional design, one of the big mistakes that I made that a lot of people make when they're new to e-learning and instructional design is I created a course with slides and walls of text that told the learner what they needed to know and understand and be aware of, and it was awful. Uh, you can see a screenshot of it here on my slide. And one of the things that I remember my coworkers and my boss telling me at the time was, you know, Tim, if you want to make this course effective, then you need to make it and you want to make it engaging, then you need to make it interactive. And I thought, oh, okay. Well, then what I'll do is I'll take all of that text that I put on the slide and I'll add some buttons so that when they click on the button, hey, it reveals some text, right? And I thought, voila, I made it interactive. Uh, you know, job done, accomplished. Well, of course, I, you know, I, I've since realized that that's not really what they meant <laughs> when they said, hey, you want to make it engaging, you need to make it interactive. Because the problem with that is that, you know, in order for the learner to click a button and reveal some content, nothing's really gained from that interaction, right? There's no critical thinking skills applied. Uh, and it was through that experience that I, I learned that knowledge and behavior aren't mutually exclusive. Just because people know more doesn't mean they're going to do more. And the types of interactivity we incorporate into our courses um, can affect whether or not our learners are actually applying and putting their critical thinking skills into practice with the con content that we're teaching. And that leads me to talking about designing branching scenarios. You know, in the world of e-learning, one of the things I've talked about before is there's usually two different types of interactivity you can incorporate into your courses. There's click to reveal interactions. And then of course we have decision based or sometimes referred to as performance based interactions. And while I think there's a time and place for click to reveal interactions, which I've talked about previously. You know, really what we want to be doing with the courses that we create is that we want our learners putting into practice the skills that we're teaching them. And one of the really great and powerful ways that we can do that is through um, branching scenarios and interactivity that allows our learner to put critical thinking skills into practice. Now, just to illustrate the contrast of what, I, of what I'm talking about here, you know, click to reveal interaction might look something like this, right? Where you have different buttons the learner clicks on and they click on it and then it reveals some content, right? And like I said, there's a time and place for these, but you know, no critical thinking skills are really applied here. The only thing the learner has to know how to do, right, is use their mouse. Um, and what we want to do or what we should be doing with our courses are moving towards interactions where the learner has to make a decision and potentially see the outcomes or the consequences of those decisions. And that's where branching scenarios or scenario-based learning comes into play, where we present the learner with a situation or a scenario where they have to decide what should they do, right? In this instance, here we have 
a situation where a customer calls in asking about a mysterious charge on their monthly bill and using the skills that we showed them earlier, respond to the customer and see what happens. So we have a situation. We have you as the customer service agent saying, hey, thanks for calling in today. How can I help you? We have a customer with their problem saying, hey, there's an extra charge on my bill for last month. And we have some responses for how the learner can respond, right? Do we transfer them to billing? Do we say, hey, sorry for the confusion. Let me see how I can help. Uh, I'm going to put you on hold or, you know, just dismiss it altogether. And then the learner has an option to select one of the four options. It might be right. It might be wrong. And we can see the outcome and we get some feedback, right? The contrast there is that this type of interaction, a scenario based example, challenges the learner to face a real world problem with real world decisions and real world outcomes and consequences. And it's a great way to help your learners put situations and skills into practice in the safety of a training environment, right? And so what I want to talk about today is how do you design these types of branching scenarios for your e-learning courses? Now, one thing I want to clarify before we jump in here is we're talking about the design aspects of creating branching scenarios. How do you go about planning a branching scenario? What do you put into your branching scenarios? What decisions do you need to make? How do you storyboard a branching scenario? We're not going to talk about developing a branching scenario. I'll have a separate how-to workshop on how you can build and develop branching scenarios in Articulate Storyline. That's my authoring tool of choice. That's a separate how-to workshop. We're just talking about the design aspects of it, right? The decision making. So let's talk quickly about, you know, some of the benefits that branching scenarios can offer you. I talked a little bit about them, but let's get a little bit more specific here. So branching scenarios are great when you want to let your learners connect training to uh, your training content to the real world, right? It sounds pretty fundamental, but this point is so important because it so frequently gets lost in a lot of the training content or training experiences or learning experiences we create in the world of instructional design. At, at the core of everything we do as instructional designers, whenever we're creating training on anything, the goal should be helping the learner understand how it relates back to the real world, how it relates back to what they're doing on the job, right? In branching scenarios, scenario-based learning is a great way to do that if it's designed properly. And we'll talk about that. Branching scenarios are also great for letting your learners experience the positive and negative outcomes of their decisions. Too often in training uh, or in e-learning that we create, we teach to the right thing we want learner learners to do, right? And we only teach that. Well, you know, in the real world, most of the learning that we experience comes not from doing the right thing, but from doing the wrong things by making mistakes. And scenario-based learning branching scenarios are a great way to allow your learners to experience the negative outcomes, the consequences of their decisions so that they can learn from it. Which of course leads me to my third point, letting learners practice tasks and behaviors in the safety of a simulated environment, right? The fact that they can make a mistake, see the outcome, they can piss a customer off in a branching scenario like this one allows them to do that in the safety of a training environment where they're not actually doing that in the real world and upsetting customers, uh, real life customers that can actually affect the company, right? Whatever the branching scenario might be on. All right, so those are some of the great situations that you can use scenarios and branching scenarios uh, and why you might want to use them. So let's talk about the anatomy of a branch, branching scenario. Before we learn how to actually build one, let's dissect it and, and look at the different components that make up branching scenarios. Um, you know, I think one of the things I'll talk about later is that I think in our industry, we do a really good job overcomplicating what it means to create and design branching scenarios. And a branching scenario really is just a, a combination of questions that are strung together in a meaningful way. So whenever you look at a branching scenario, it, you can be overwhelming looking at the whole of the thing that's created, all the different pathways and options and outcomes a learner might experience. But when you break it down into its individual components, a branching scenario just starts with an individual scenario question, usually some form of a multiple choice question where you have a situation, a question, you have different options, right? Now, if we zoom out from there, Branching scenarios are usually comprised of multiple variations of these multiple choice questions, right? Or these multiple, what I call decision points. And then if we zoom out even further from that, those are then strung together in some sort of meaningful story path or scenario path where the learner makes a decision. It might branch the learner into multiple different paths or directions. It might converge back together. Um, but it's a series of multiple choice questions strung together 
in some sort of meaningful, situational, contextual, story-like way, if that makes any sense, right? Now let's zoom back in into the individual question and we'll take a look at this real world example that I was showing you earlier and let's look at the different elements here, right? Just like you have different components that make up a traditional multiple choice question or assessment question or knowledge check question, whatever you whatever you want to call it, those same elements tend to exist in branching scenario questions as well. So for example, we have the question or situation. Oftentimes in branching scenarios, the question isn't really positioned as a question. You might have the part like, how would you respond or what would you do? But it also includes the situational context. And that's the important thing about scenarios is that it has to have some sort of situational context in which the learner is making some sort of decision. So we have the question, the situation. In this example, we're helping a customer with a mysterious bill uh, or charge on their bill. And then, of course, down below that or somewhere on the on the slide, we also have the options. These are the different pathways that the learner can choose from, the different decision points where they can decide, in this instance, how do they want to respond to this customer, right? And then, of course, depending on those options and the distractors, distractors being the, the incorrect options, uh, we also have outcomes and feedback, right? The other thing that makes a branching scenario question different from, say, a multiple choice question is that we not only give the learner feedback about the decision that they made, but we can also see the outcome of that decision. So in this example, the learner gets it wrong. You can see there on the left, we have some feedback. And then on the right here with our customer, we can see the outcome of it. In this instance, you know, the customer does not want to be put on hold because they've been on hold for 10 minutes. So we're experiencing the consequences of our actions. Now that's a simplified example of a branching scenario question. And I'll show you some real life examples that go into a little bit more detail and you can see how it can branch into different pathways a little bit later. So that's the anatomy of a branching scenario, specifically the branching scenario question. The next thing that we need to address is how do you actually go about designing your branching scenarios? Um, like I said earlier, you know, branching scenarios aren't as complicated as we like to make them out to be. I think in our industry, we do a good job of making everything way more complicated than it needs to be. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, but if there's one thing I want you to remember as I go through today's content and as you're designing your own scenario based, you know, experiences or branching scenarios within your courses, remember this branching scenarios at their core are really just multiple choice questions strung together in some sort of story, right? They're multiple choice questions that are strung together in a story and they oftentimes build off of one another. So you have a multiple choice question that links to or branches to another multiple choice question or a series of multiple choice questions that relates previously to the one that they had just experienced and then so forth and so on. And they might have different outcomes or they might go in different pathways. But at the end of the day, they're just multiple choice questions that are presented in a interesting story based way or a contextual way. And I'll show you a bunch of different examples of that as well. So how do we design branching scenarios uh, specifically for e-learning? Well, I'm going to talk about three things uh, that go into designing branching scenarios. And we can go down a really deep rabbit hole talking about the different considerations for types of feedback or how many branches you should have. And I'll give some guidance on it, but we're going to keep it at a high level. Some of the high level considerations or steps that you need to take when designing a branching scenario. So the first thing you need to do is identify the decision points, right? You have to be able to identify what is it that we want the learner to be able to do on the job. And then how do we map that back to individual decision points questions that we're going to ask the learner in our e-learning course. So like I said earlier, in this example, we have the situation, we have the question, and then down below, we have the different options that the learner can choose from. Uh, and that makes up an individual decision point. So how do we identify those? Well, the first thing that we need to do is work with our subject matter experts. That's always the first thing we need to do because they're going to be able to help us identify and understand the behaviors our learners need to emulate on the job. And this is a, a really important point they have to understand about designing scenario-based learning is that it's not about identifying what do learners need to know or understand. It's about identifying the decisions, uh, the actions, the behaviors, the tasks that learners need to make on the job. One of the things I've talked about before is that I never use the word no with my subject matter experts, K-N-O-W. Uh, I never say, well, what do they need to know or understand or be aware of? Uh, I always say, what do people need to do on the job? What are the behaviors they need to take on the job? What are the decisions they need to make on the job? If you can start asking those questions, then you can start identifying 
uh, how those map back to individual decision points that you need to then simulate in some sort of branching scenario. Um, the other thing you need to identify is the situational context. In what situation are they making these um, you know, decisions, right? It's, it's not good enough to create a scenario or a question that asks the learner, what's the proper way to greet a customer? No, maybe it needs to be, what's the proper way to greet a customer when they call and they're really angry, right? What is the actual situational context in which the learner is applying these skills or are applying these skills in, in the real world, right? I think back to, um, you know, I used to be the director of instructional design at GoDaddy, and actually I have some examples from GoDaddy that I'll show you later. And one of the things I discovered when I first took over that job is one of the things that we were training our call center agents to, we were training them to these idealistic situations about how they interact with a customer. So let me give you an example. One of the things that we would teach them uh, when a customer would call in and maybe they want to build a website for their portfolio or something, we would design these scenarios where the customer would call in and say, hi, I'm, I'm a small business owner and I'm looking to build a website. Can you help me? Right? Well, that's not really how customers act. <laughs> Those aren't things that they really say when they call in. And we were designing scenarios and training towards situations and contexts that didn't actually happen in the real world. So when I say identify the situational context, I'm talking about the real things that your learners experience on the job. Going back to the GoDaddy example, the real thing that they experience on the job when a customer would call in is it would be, uh, yeah, my website's down and I can't figure out how to get it back up. Help me. Well, how do we train to that is very different than how do we train to, hi, I want to build a website. I'm a small business owner that fits this particular customer category. Help me, right? It's totally two different situations. So you want to identify the real situational context in which your learners are applying these behaviors and tasks so that you can be as realistic as possible in your scenarios. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. I know I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there with that story, but you know, it proved my point. All right. One of the ways that you, one of the really great ways that you can identify the different decision points when you're designing branching scenarios is by conducting a task analysis and or probably and uh, more so than or create an action map. Now, let me talk about a task analysis first. If you if you're not familiar with um, uh, conducting a task analysis or, or performing a task analysis, it's a real methodical procedure process that you go through to dissect and reverse engineer. Uh, a procedure, a best practice, so you can identify each of the individual steps, tasks, and subtasks that go into performing that particular procedure. Now, in my opinion, tasks analysis work really well with procedural behaviors, things that have well-defined steps and actions that the learner needs to take. They're not really great for behavioral um, uh, procedures or or tasks that they might be performing on the job. But if you are creating something that you know has a very specific systematic process, a task analysis might be a great way to do that. Um, on the other hand, Action Map is another really great tool process you can use that is great to um, perform in, con in, in collaboration with your subject matter experts to reverse engineer and backwards design the different behaviors your learners need to perform on the job to achieve a specific goal. And I did a whole separate how-to workshop that I'll link to below or up above on uh, Action Mapping. But to give you a quick overview, Action Mapping is just a quick... Um, it's not quick, I meant the overview I'm gonna give is quick, is a backwards design process where you start with a specific goal that you're looking to achieve. And so in this example, maybe the goal we're trying to achieve with our training, the business goal, is to increase customer service scores by 10% by end of year, right? So if that's our goal, then what we need to identify outside of that are the different behaviors, actions, steps, tasks that our learners need to do on the job to achieve that goal, right? So that might be asking probing questions, understand the customer's needs, matching the customer with the right product that fits their needs, explaining the product benefits to the customer, or maybe it's overcoming you know, common customer objections to closing the sale. And then what we can do from there is identify the different um, types of training activities that we might design to help the learner practice those behaviors. But identifying those behaviors and how they map back to a specific business goal is a really great way to figure out each of those decision points in collaboration, collaboration with your subject matter experts. Okay, so how to design branching scenarios. First one, identify the decision points. Once you've identified the decision points, then you want to do, uh, then what you want to do is identify the common mistakes and the outcomes. And this is perhaps, in my opinion, the most important 
And it's oftentimes the most difficult part of designing a branching scenario. If you've ever written assessment questions before or created, um, you know, uh, detailed knowledge checks or quiz questions, writing the uh, uh, distractors or the wrong answers uh, are typically the hardest part of it. And that is also true when you're creating scenario-based questions. So just to be clear, the, um, the mistakes or the different options the learner can choose from, going back to this example, are all those different responses you see down there across the bottom, right? Um, so there's different ways that the learner can respond in this instance to our upset customer. And, you know, if they choose the wrong answer, we also have some feedback and we have the outcomes. It's super, super important, as I'll talk about here in a moment, that those are realistic. Um, and so you want to spend a lot of time identifying these. So how do I identify the common mistakes and outcomes? Well, again, as I mentioned before, start with your subject matter experts. But with all things subject matter experts, you want to trust but verify. Because the thing that they're going to do is they're always going to want to defer to what's the correct thing that learners need to do. Uh, but what we're really wanting to explore here are the mistakes, the negative things that learners are going to do and the outcomes of it. So work with your subject matter experts. They can help you. But one of the things I oftentimes recommend is talking to and observing your learners. If you can talk to and understand what mistakes they made when they were first starting on the job, or if you can observe your learners in the work environment and maybe observe new learners, uh, new employees, and see what common mistakes their uh, uh, experiencing on the job, then you can build those into the scenario and make them as realistic as possible, which of course leads me to my third point. Be realistic and plausible. That's the most important thing. So when you think about those, you know, in this example, those four different responses that the learner can choose from, the, the most important thing is that they're all plausible. Uh, they're all things that can actually happen on the job or mistakes that somebody might make. And the feedback or the outcomes that the learner receives are also equally as plausible. Um, you know, if you've ever taken a really uh, a quiz that had really poorly written quiz questions, uh, you know, you can get the right answer without knowing anything about the content, right? Because you have a question on, you know, what's the molecular structure of water, right? And the answers are you know, H2O, which is the correct answer. And then we have, you know, cork, iPhone, and I don't know, cheddar cheese biscuit, right? Clearly, those answers are not accurate. It's the H2O one that's accurate. And I know that's an extreme example, but you know exactly what I'm talking about when the distractors, the options are ridiculous, right? Okay, so we talked about identifying the decision points. We talked about identifying the common mistakes and outcomes. And then the third step is to sequence those decision points. And this is where uh, people oftentimes get overwhelmed with designing the branching scenarios because they go into too much detail. They over, uh, over design their branching scenarios. And so I want to talk about a couple different options for sequencing your branching scenarios. One of the common mistakes or maybe misconceptions or myths that I think a lot of people run into when they're designing their branching scenarios is that they believe that their branching scenarios always have to be truly branching, meaning that you have a decision point that links to you know, one or more different outcomes, let's say three outcomes, and then each of those three outcomes or decision points link to three more, and you have this really complex pyramid looking structure to your branching scenarios. Well, they don't all have to be that way. In fact, branching scenarios don't all necessarily have to be branching. Um, and so there's a couple different options you can take when you think about sequencing the different decision points that you might build into your branching scenario. One might be a linear sequence where they actually just go in order. There's no branching. I'll show you an example of that. Um, you might have a true branching uh, sequence or you might have a hybrid experience. So let's take a look at a linear sequence. Linear sequence is literally, you know, a series of scenario-based questions or decision points that just happen in sequence, one after the other. They, you know, they might have different uh, options and different outcomes and feedback, but regardless of what the learner chooses, they're going to go to the next decision point, the next question immediately after their previous one. And those can be, as I'll show you some examples here in a little bit, those can be just as effective as a true branching scenario. So, you know, when we talk about creating scenario-based e-learning, you know, if you're brand new to it, if you need to, you can ignore the word branching. It can just be scenario-based e-learning. It doesn't always have to be branching, right? 
Now, with that being said, a true branching experience looks something like this, right? Where you have a decision point, it branches to say in this example, three different decision points, and then uh, those decision points branch to maybe three more decision points, right? And like I said, you have this really complex structure that can get really, really complex really, really quickly. And I'll show you a real life example of one of these here as well. And then of course we have what I call a hybrid sequence where you might have some questions that are decision points where there's a question and branches to multiple different um, outcomes with multiple different uh, decision points. And then maybe they all converge back into one, uh, which is called a bottleneck, right? This is really great if you're wanting to control the scope of your branching scenarios. And it might be good where you know the first um, decision point that branches to three might be the question on uh, you know how to greet the customer. And then and depending on those outcomes, they still all go down to the next step, which is a new task or behavior that's being simulated in the scenario. And these are great when you're wanting to control the scope and complexity of your branching scenarios. Now, uh, before we talk about some more considerations when designing your branching scenarios, and I show you some different examples, I do want to talk, uh, take a moment talking about how do you actually storyboard your branching scenarios? Because this is, uh, whether you're creating a linear branching scenario or a true branching scenario or a hybrid, it can become, it can be, um, uh, overwhelming and, and complicated figuring out how to storyboard it. And the reason why that is, is that most storyboards, whether you're doing a written storyboard or a visual storyboard, uh, which I've talked about previously, most storyboards are written in a, uh, uh, a linear format, right? And so we have written storyboards. Those are great if you want to create some really simple, uh, scenarios that are probably going to happen in a linear format. You don't have a lot of branching. You don't have complex graphics. Um, those are great. You know, written storyboards are just fine for that. You might use a visual storyboard if you're creating something that's a little bit more complex. Maybe you have some light branching um, and you want to visualize, you know, the branching scenario on the screen. Again, I've talked about storyboards before. You could check out the link below or above uh, for that. But like I said, the, the issue still exists that most storyboards are written in a linear fashion, so it can get really confusing if you're trying to create a or storyboard a branching scenario where you have on the storyboard, you know, if the learner clicks this, then they jump to slide five, and then if they click this, they go to slide eight, and then you're before you know it, you're scrolling up and down the storyboard. And it's not only confusing for you as the instructional designer developer to storyboard that, but it can be even more confusing for your stakeholders, your subject matter experts to review that type of storyboard. So what you might do instead uh, of a written or a visual storyboard is you might use uh, a tool to visualize your branching scenario. So one of the tools I use quite frequently is Miro. Miro is a mind mapping tool. There's several other ones out there that you can use. What I like about it is that you can actually visualize the flow of your branching scenario. So this is obviously a simplified example. You might actually include the text of your branching scenario and the feedback and the content that you're gonna put on it, but it allows you to visualize the different pathways the learner might take. And you can zoom in and out and add all sorts of levels of detail to, to something like this. So Miro or other mind mapping tools are really great for that. Um, another tool that you might use is Twine. Uh, and I'll put a link down in the description for this. Twine is a, um, it's kind of a mind mapping tool. It's kind of a prototyping tool, but it's really meant to structure and outline nonlinear stories. And so people use Twine when they're designing, you know, games and other sorts of nonlinear stories. But you can also use it to outline and almost prototype branching scenarios. And the cool thing about Twine is just like with Miro, how you can create a map of your branching scenario, you can actually like preview and play through it and click through the branching scenario. And so it's great for prototyping, storyboarding, wireframing a branching scenario. I wouldn't use it to design it visually, but if you're just thinking about the content of your branching scenario, Twine is a great tool for that. And it's free. There's a little bit of a learning curve, um, but it's definitely worth uh, checking out. All right, so I want to give you some final tips and considerations for designing branching scenarios, and then I'll show you some real-world examples. So the first thing I want to point out is that you want to keep the scope uh, and complexity of your branching scenarios fit for function. Fit for function is one of my favorite phrases to use in our industry, and what it means is that you're not designing something more complicated than what you actually need to achieve whatever your desired goal is. 
The opposite of fit for function is something called gold plating, where you are polishing something beyond the point where you're going to receive an ROI. And so if you don't need to design a full complex branching scenario with 11 different outcomes, then don't do that if it's not going to enhance the learning experience or achieve a better outcome, right? So if you can achieve the desi your desired outcome with something that's like a linear scenario-based experience, then great, do that. You don't have to create something overly complex if you don't need it. Um, the other thing that's really important, another consideration, is don't be afraid to let your learners fail. One of the examples I'm going to show you, uh, it's almost encouraging. You almost want to encourage your learner to make the wrong decision because more learning might happen through your failure than through just doing the right answer alone. So don't be afraid to allow your learners to explore and go down the wrong path, even if they know it's wrong, because there's a lot of learning and engagement that can happen from that, and you'll see in a moment. And then finally, keep everything realistic and plausible. That's so important when you're designing anything that's scenario-based where, you know, if you want the learner to truly practice what they're going to be doing in the real world back on the job, then whatever you're creating a scenario on has to be realistic and plausible. Uh, there has to be some sort of verisimilitude to the thing that you're creating. There has to be truthfulness um, for the learner if you want it to be effective, right? All right, so let's take a look at some real world examples. I'm gonna show you some examples that are really, really simple examples of scenario-based learning where there's no branching whatsoever. And then I'll show you some more complex examples of scenarios. And then I'm gonna show you some different types of scenarios that go against the grain of what most people think of when they think of branching scenarios. All right, so let's take a look. All right, so my first example here, this is from a compliance course that I helped design and create for a client a few years ago, uh, West Virginia University Medicine. And this compliance course was on doing the right thing, maintaining a culture of diversity, inclusion, and respect. And like most compliance courses, you know, there's a lot of content. It can be rather boring, but one of the things that we wanted to build into it were some really simple scenario-based questions where the learner had to practice putting some of these concepts into practice, identifying bias or harassment. And so in this example, I'll click through some of the content here. We're not going to read the content. I just want to click through to get to the scenarios here. Here's our menu. We'll go into the section about diversity and inclusion. Content, compliance content, legal stuff, HR stuff, right? Pretty stereotypical compliance course. Um, but eventually we get to some questions like these, right? And one of the hallmarks of scenario-based learning, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's not just about asking the learner knowledge-based questions. It's about positioning content in the form of a scenario or position it situationally. And there's several different ways you can do that. Do that. And I think this is a good example of a hybrid between what would be a multiple choice question, but it's presented with some different uh, situational context, right? So this one's really, really simple. There's no branching here, but it still, in my opinion, constitutes as a scenario-based question. So this question is, is it discrimination? Select all the behaviors you think could be examples of discrimination under our policy and then click the submit button, right? So in this example, we just have to read some simple situations and identify what is and what is not discrimination. So not selecting someone for the job because of their religious attire, is that discrimination? Yeah. Uh, providing fair compensation based on experience, skills, and contribution? No. Not considering a pregnant woman for a promotion because she will go on maternity leave soon? Yeah, that's discrimination. Not telling an older employee about a job opportunity because they'll assume they'll retire soon. Yeah, that's discrimination. And promoting a less qualified male over a more qualified female employee. And that sounds like discrimination, right? Click submit. We get some feedback and we move on, right? Again, it's a multiple choice question, but it's presented in a contextual way, right? In that example, it leaned more towards multiple choice question, but it felt like, you know, it had some scenario based elements. Again, same thing here. Is it discrimination? Calling them a minority worker, derogatory name? Yeah. Providing reasonable accommodations for an employee with a disability? No. Teasing a coworker because of his or her accent? Yep. Saying happy, saying happy birthday to a coworker? No. Telling a joke that degrades women? Absolutely. Forcing an employee to participate in prayer service at work? For sure. Click submit. Again, we get some feedback, right? All right. And then what we do is after we have those simple questions identify, you know, let's get a baseline. What is and is not discrimination? Now let's put it into context, right? So we're building on what we just 
tested the learner on previously. So now we have some more situational stories. So in this example, we have Benjamin's story. So Benjamin's having lunch in the break room when he overhears two employees telling a joke, which includes a stereotypical antidote about uh, black women. Although Benjamin is white male and the joke isn't being directed at him personally, he finds it offensive. Do you think this situation could be an example of discrimination under our policy, right? So we have some different situations uh, or decisions uh, that Benjamin can make. So because Benjamin is a white male and the joke isn't directed towards him. It's not a violation. It's clearly not the right answer. Because the joke is being shared privately between two employees while they were off the clock for lunch. It's not a violation of our policy. I don't think so. It could be discrimination and a violation of our policy. Benjamin should report the behavior, right? That's probably the correct answer. So we'll click submit. And then, of course, we get some feedback, right? And I'll show you some examples here a little bit later where I'll choose the wrong answer. And then again, we have another story, another situational context where the learner has to make a decision. How would they react on the job, right? And we could, you know, we could scale these types of scenario questions up and down depending on the needs of our learners and the needs of the course and the scope of the project, right? We could have built these out where the learner chooses the wrong answer and then there's an outcome or a consequence or a different situation. And these examples, these are more like, like I said, those multiple choice questions. They're presented contextually in a situation in a story. Uh, and there's still, you know, different choices and outcomes, but the scope is kept pretty simple, right? Let's take a look at another example here. Um, this example here is uh, a good example of like a true, true, true branching scenario where there's a decision, different outcomes, and then it branches to different decisions and different outcomes from there. Now, this one's not a real project that was created for a real call center. This one was a demo one that I created years and years and years ago when I was first uh, learning Storyline and teaching people how to use Storyline. So it looks a little bit dated. Some of the technical stuff doesn't work as well as it used to years ago, but it still uh, is a great example. So some call center training. What I like about this one is this one includes some different personalization options or gamification options where the learner can, you know, type in their name to personalize the course. This is a great example where the, you know, storylines text entry field is being a little funky because it used to be really funky. Sometimes they still are a little glitchy, but we can enter our name. We can also select an avatar. We'll go with this guy here and we'll continue forward. We'll choose the scenario. Let's go with a billing question and we'll go ahead and start our scenario. So here we go. We're a new call center employee. In this scenario, you'll be helping a customer with a billing question. The goal is to help the customer with their questions without escalating the situation, all right? So let's click begin. Here's our first decision point. Thanks for calling Compay. My name is Tim. How can I help you today? And now we have our customer come in. Hey, Tim, I just got a bill and there's a $50 service fee. The rep said I wouldn't have to pay. How would you respond, right? So in this example, we have two options, right? So the first option, you probably misunderstood the guy, so there's not much I can do uh, about it. Who'd you talk to? Or maybe we can do, well, that looks, uh, well, let's look into that. Let me pull up your account. Do you remember who you talked to, right? There's two options here. Now, this is a good example where it's a true branching scenario. So no matter what option I choose from, there's going to be a unique response, unique feedback and a unique response by the customer. And how the story progresses will vary depending on what I select. Now, this is also a good example of letting the learner fail. Whenever I demonstrate this, I always like to piss off the customer personally. So we're going to intentionally get it wrong and see how mad we can make our customer. So we're going to say, you probably misunderstood the guy. There's not much I can do about it. Who'd you talk to? So let's select that. And look what happens, right? Our customer, her face changes. It gets a little orange, it's, you know, representing a little bit more anger here. And she says, well, how am I supposed to remember? You're the ones with all the records. All I know is that he told me I wouldn't have to pay because of some promotion. I'm not paying it. And we get some feedback. You know, be careful with your words when responding to customers. We're there to help. Let's continue the scenario and see how we can de-escalate the situation, right? All right, so now we have two more options we can choose from. We can say, listen, don't get mad at me. I didn't cause the problem. Hold, please. Or you're right. I'm sorry. Let's look into this and see what I can find in the system. May I put you on hold while I research this? Well, I want to piss off the customer. So we're going to select this one. We're going to say, don't get mad at me. We're going to put her on hold. And now she's red. She's fuming, right? Well, that's your problem. Ugh. Uh, and then we, you know, we get some more feedback. Try not to make the, try not to take the customer's frustration personally. We want to answer their questions. We still have an opportunity to de-escalate the situation by staying calm and professional. Well, let's see what happens. Let's see if we can get the customer to like cancel their service, right? So we have two more options. Okay, well, uh, you were wrong. I looked at the records and you have to pay the $50. That's our policy on all accounts. Or you're right, the fee is waived in the form of a rebate. Can I send you the rebate slip? 
Well, I'm going to get it wrong. We're going to say she has to pay it. Uh, now she's super angry. I don't have to pay it. Uh, he told me I didn't have to pay it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have signed up. I'd like to cancel my service, right? So we lost the customer. Now, is the learner really going to do this in the real world? No, probably. They'd probably be fired for doing that, right? But it's kind of fun. It's engaging. The learner gets the opportunity to really fail and see what happens. And what's important is they get to try again, right? So I can go back to the beginning and go through this and maybe we'll try to make the customer happy, right? So maybe what I'll do in this example is I'll make her a little bit angry, but then let's see if we can fix it, right? So she got her bill, $50 service fee, and we're going to say, mm, you probably misunderstood the person. There's not much I can do about it. Who'd you talk to? She's going to get orange. We went down this path before. Okay, let's see if we can de-escalate it. Okay, we'll continue. And now let's see what happens if we say, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry. Let me see what I can find in the system. May I put you on hold? Okay. And her face changes a little bit. She goes, I suppose so, but she's still annoyed, right? How we how we responded the first time. This is a very contextual response. So we say, good job. You seem to be de-escalating the situation. Let's continue on. Okay, and then we have two more unique responses. I found the $50 charge, but there's nothing I can do about it. That's not my department. Or you're right. The fee will be waived from the form in the form of a rebate. Can I send you the slip? Let's do that one. Okay. She's green, but she's still, you know, a little upset. She says, I think that'll work. Thanks for all your help, right? So we did an okay job. The customer seems okay with the result. However, we could have handled it better, right? And then, of course, we could try again. So this is a good example of a true, true, true branching scenario. And I think in this example, there's like 27 different outcomes, depending on the different options that the learner chooses through all of these different decision points. And this is complex, right? This would be complex to build because there's all sorts of different pathways the learner can choose from. Um, but it's a good example of a true, true, true branching scenario, right? Okay, so that's a good example of a customer service sort of interaction. What I want to show you now um, is an example of some scenario-based learning that doesn't align with what I think most people think of when they think of a traditional branching scenario. I think one of the, one of the, mm, I'll say mistakes <laughs> that we make in our industry is when we think of scenarios, we always think of you know, person to person interactions where there's a customer service agent or a customer service person interacting with an angry customer or two people talking. And the truth is, is not all scenario based e-learning interactions or branching scenarios have to be about customer interactions. It's not about a person to person interaction. It's about decision points that the learner has to make, right? And so this example, this is a, a GoDaddy example on security awareness. This was a compliance course. And what I like about it and what I love about it is, is it's all scenario based. All of the content is taught through scenarios and they're not scenarios that are involved interacting with another person. They're scenarios that interact, that are deal with different decision points the learner has to make throughout their day to maintain security, data security on the job. So I'll show you this. I'll go ahead and click start here. We have some opening content about the importance of uh, data security at GoDaddy. You know, uh, I, I'm not going to make you read that, so we'll click OK. And we have our main menu here. Maybe what we'll do is identify, you know, recognizing phishing attempts. So I'll click Go here. And uh, again, we have some content about the importance of data security at GoDaddy. I'll go ahead and click Start here. And uh, we have an interaction here. Oh, and it's we have an email, right? So this one is an example where we're going through a different type of scenario. It's not an interaction. We're going to be opening up an email. So we'll click on this email. We have an email here and we're asked to, you know, what would we do? Does it look fine or should we alert security? So let's read it here. So it's about our asset management system updates from uh, somebody here, our chief financial officer. So he says, the finance department is working on updating employee records to a new asset management system for the upcoming year. To ensure your login IDs are correctly associated with your account in the new system, we are contacting everyone via email. We're also requiring every employee to confirm their bank account and routing numbers so we have the most up-to-date information for tax purposes. Please respond with your correct bank account and routing number. Does it look fine or should we alert security? Well, I think we should alert security on this one, right? Good catch. There's some red flags in this email that suggest it could be a phishing attempt. Let's find out what those red flags are. So we'll click next here. Uh, now that we've identified the email as a potential threat, read the email again and click on the phrases uh, or email fields that are suspicious red flags. So now what we do is we've identified it's a suspicious email. That was pretty simple. But now what we have to do is identify what about it is suspicious, right? So, hmm. 
Uh, what about this? To ensure our login IDs are correctly associated with your account of the new system, we're contacting everyone via email. What's the red flag here? Mm, contacting via email, I would say. Yeah, that's right, right? GoDaddy would not ask you to supply bank information through email. Okay, cool. We'll click next here. What else? Um, we're requiring, oh, please respond with your bank account routing number. Mm, no, we're not doing our personal account information. That's right. And we found both of the issues here. So we finished that scenario. All right, we'll continue on from there. Oh, we have another email. So I'll click on this one. Okay, this is from Gigi, one of our coworkers. She needs last minute help and she says, uh, I know this is, uh, isn't a lot of warning, but I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow morning and Dave was supposed to cover for me. Turns out he thought I meant next week and I don't have anyone else who can fill in. Since I did you a favor last week, can you let me know ASAP if you are available to come in early tomorrow? Dave feels bad and said he would switch shifts with uh, you some other time if you could help. Please let me know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with here. This one looks fine. So this is a good example where we're incorporating normal situations. Learners don't have to do anything with, right? So that's totally fine. Let's continue on. Nope, we have another email. Click on this one. Um, okay, so this one's from notifications at security12.com. That looks weird. We recently blocked a sign-in attempt on your account. Click on this link. Mm, we're going to alert security. Okay, so good catches. Let's find those red flags here. Uh, let's see. Mm, I think this is a red flag. This email looks weird. So, yeah, email domain is security12.com. That's right. They would never email from that. Okay, what else is a red flag? Uh, this URL that we have to click on. Uh, asking you to review your activity. The hyperlink provided looks suspicious. And that's right, right? So again, we're going through these decision points um, and we're making decisions, seeing the outcomes. Good work. We found all the red flags. Let's continue on. And oh, now our phone's ringing. So I'll go ahead and click on our phone here. And we have this person calling. This is Jessica. I'm a designer with phone metrics. I met your advertising manager, Emma, at the conference last week. She gave me her business card, but I seem to have misplaced it. We got cut uh, short in the middle of discussing a potential partnership opportunity. She asked me to call her to follow up. Could you please give me her email and phone number so I can get in touch with her? The opportunity is time sensitive, so I need to reach her ASAP, right? So what should we do? Provide the information, decline the request. Well, let's get it wrong. Let's provide the information. Let me get some feedback not so fast. Let's look at the three red flags. Okay. So we identified that we should have alerted security. Now let's look at the, re the red flags. Mm, well, the opportunity here seems time sensitive. That's weird. Yep, the opportunity is vague. Oh, it's creating time pressure. That sounds right. And we get some positive feedback about why that might be suspicious. Um, okay, that's not a red flag. She asked me to call her follow-up, right? So that might be an issue. Um, She's asking you instead of Emma. That does seem weird. Okay. Uh, and then can we give her the phone number and email? So let's select that. And then requesting the contact info. That's a red flag as well, right? So we identified all the red flags. We did it. Okay. So though, oh, we have another phone call. You know what? Let's go to the main menu. Let's go look at a different one. So that was the phishing attempts one. I'll show you two more that are really cool, uh, like password security. Sometimes you can create scenario-based examples or interactions that are more meaningful that aren't necessarily branching scenarios or even scenarios at all. Sometimes they're a little gamification uh, interactions. And so in this example, uh, this one's really simple. This one's kind of like a click to reveal, but we're challenged with creating a strong password. So we have this little password meter here. And depending on what we select, what elements we want to add to our password, you can raise or lower our password meter, right? So what if we were to select, you know, save login, save time? We can see our little meter goes down. We get some feedback on how that doesn't create a strong password. So let's keep going. Maybe we want to increase the password length. Okay, we get some positive feedback. Our meter goes up. Uh, maybe we want to add symbols to the password. Okay, get some positive feedback. Our meter goes up. We're going to change our password regularly. That checks on over here. We get some good feedback and our meter again goes up. And we're going to add multiple digits to the password. Yep, and our meter goes up. We have a good password. Again, a simple little situation, not really a scenario, but a, a decision-based interaction where we have to create a strong password or make decisions about what makes a strong password. Scenario-based learning, but not presented in a traditional scenario way, right? Good work. Learn about passwords, blah, blah, blah. And we'll go back to the menu. And let's do one more. Let's do this physical security one. This is another cool one. 
Um, so we have to protect our protect us and our customers, maintain high levels of security within our work environment. And so in this example, what we have to do is there are five security concerns in the scene. Explore the entire scene and click on each security secure security concern and add it to our list, right? So we have our little list here. Well, the door's left open, right? Door's propped open. Uh, that's right. Entry doors should always remain closed when not in use. That makes sense. Uh, what about the computer? Okay. Yep, the computer's unlocked. What, what's, why is that an issue? Well, it wastes electricity. That doesn't seem like a security concern. Others may see private uh, or gain access to private information. Yeah, that's definitely the concern there. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, we have the password listed here. Click on that. Uh, password isn't cool enough. It's embarrassing. Or anyone who sees the written password can access the account, right? That's a big issue. Okay. Uh, we have the badge here. We don't leave our badge out, right? Uh, and then we have our customer file, right? We don't want to leave that out there. And now we found all of the issues. Again, challenging the learner to observe, use some critical thinking skills, even if it's such a simple scenario like this one, right? We found all the security risks. All right, so that's a quick overview of how to go about designing branching scenarios for e-learning. What I want you to remember is that, you know, not all branching scenarios have to be truly branching. They can be as simple or as complex as you want them to be. And if you want to, if there's one thing I want you to remember as you move forward is that branching scenarios or scenario-based learning is really just multiple choice questions that are presented in a contextual or uh, situational way. Uh, they're really far more simple than we oftentimes make them out to be in our industry. And so remember, uh, make them as simple or as complex as you need them to be, keep them realistic and plausible, and make sure you allow your learner uh, or you give your learner realistic outcomes, consequences, and don't be afraid to let them fail as they go through your scenarios, all right? So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. As I mentioned at the top of today's video, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and that bell button so that you'll get alerted the next time I publish a video just like this one. And of course, join us inside the eLearning Designers community with the link down in the comments. It's completely free and it's a great place to connect, network, and learn with others who are also looking to grow their eLearning design skills and careers. All right, my name is Tim Slade and until next time, I'll see you around.